I'm listening. I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening. I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. My ears are wide open. My eyes are now open to see what I may be. I'm listening. I am listening. Spirit, speak to me. I'm listening. I am listening. In this moment of Spirit speaks to me. I can hear the voices of all my kids. I'm listening. Singing. I am listening. The sweet singing. How singing to the wind. My ears are wide open. Oh, oh, the joy. My eyes are wide open. Oh, oh, oh the love. To see and to hear. For you be and me. Oh, oh, oh. I'm listening in this moment of silence. I am listening. I hear spirit speak through me. Welcome to our worship service. Let's settle into our spaces. Take a deep breath in and out. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe we are all connected in this world, and we value the worth and dignity of each and every person. We pull on the wisdom of many sources to teach us, guide us, and help us understand this world. As we prepare our hearts for worship, let us remember our connections through our collective chalice lighting words. Please join me. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. Now we'll take a moment to acknowledge our connection to those whose land we occupy. We gather on the homeland of the Piscosa, where they lived for generations upon generations and were the stewards of this land. The Piscosa people still live here. Under the 1855 Yakima Treaty and the Session Agreement of 1893, the Piscosa retained 36 square miles of this homeland on which their traditional hunting, fishing, and gathering rights were guaranteed. For almost two centuries, the United States government has broken its treaty obligations. The rights of the Piscosa were stolen by the government through fraudulent surveys, indifference, and intentional violations. Much of the Piscosa land was transferred to colonists and corporations. None of the remaining land was preserved for the Piscosa. Hunting, fishing, and gathering rights were denied. In 2010, the fishing rights of the Piscosa were finally confirmed through litigation. The government still refuses to acknowledge their land rights. The Piscosa continue their traditions and seek to have all their rights recognized. Our opening words are from Thomas Merton. We are living in the greatest revolution in history, a huge, spontaneous upheaval of the entire human race. Not a revolution planned, 
and carried out by any particular party, race, or nation. But a deep elemental boiling over of all the inter inner contradictions that have ever been. A revelation of the chaotic forces inside everybody. This is not something we have chosen, nor is it something we are free to avoid. Come, let us worship. Please raise your voices and spirit in our opening hymn, We Are Gentle, Angry People. This past year, I have led two groups focused on racial justice. The first is a racial study group. This group picked resources to study together and then gathered to have a discussion. After a few sessions, many of the participants started asking how they could take action and they turned their focus to study as well as to act. The second group was a racial justice accountability group. This group had individual learning and action plans they developed for themselves and each month they would gather to share their progress, their struggles, and resources. Today you will hear from members of each of these groups either through their written answers to what they learned or through a verbal re reflection. Before we start though, I invite you to settle into a space of reflection and listen to members of the First Unitarian Church of Brooklyn sing Why Not Every Man. Why not have 
I grew up in a very diverse neighborhood in New York, an area or borough known as the Bronx. When I say diverse, I mean economically and culturally. I had a very strong parental influence, both parents, and learned at a young age to respect everyone, regardless of race or social economic worth. The lessons I took to heart throughout my entire life. With specific examples in high school, interacting in different races, in sports, and learning to respect individual skills was, was paramount. In the military, I had an eye-opening experience. One month after I entered boot camp, 
there was a ship called the Pueblo that was captured by the Koreans. The drill instructor singled out one of the recruits who was Korean and made him do a lot of extracurricular activities. He actually made him go through the obstacle course backwards and sneak up on the, on the mannequins and stab them in the back, which is what he said all Koreans would do. That drill instructor was gone in two days, replaced by another person. What he did was evil. I think everyone in the platoon realized that. At least I hope they realized that. The people that we were going to be training with were going to be relying on to help us save our own lives. Later, I worked in New York City where I hired many, many, many people for a company that I worked for and never did race or religion sway my decision. Some were hired from Harlem, where predominantly racially makeup is African-American. Others from Queens, where many are Indian or Pakistani. Always hiring if they could do the job. Relationships were diverse. And my children even got involved in this because my work quite often involved phone calls that came to the house. And when my kids would answer the phone, they would automatically run and say, Dad, it's for you. And I'd say, who is it? And they say, I don't know, but I can't understand them because of their accent, so it must be for you. Recently, sitting at a restaurant with Kimbris in Seattle, we sat at a bar because there were no tables available. The appetizer that I had was ex exceptional. I turned to the man next to me and asked him if he had ever had it. He said no. I offered him a taste. The bartender was clearly surprised because I offered a stranger, a black stranger, a black stranger, something off my plate. Prejudice is everywhere. We have a choice how to respond. More recently, I have sought out tradesmen to do work on my own vehicles or around the house. And I go to minority groups because I know they don't always get a fair shake and have opportunities that other groups may have. By reading the book Cast by Isabel Wilkinson, it sheds light on the caste system in the United States and other parts of the world. We as individuals have choices. You can make a choice each and every day. I challenge you to go out into your community, whether it be on Zoom or whether it be doing your normal running about town and make those choices. Expose yourself to other cultures and other individuals. Get to know somebody, get to just say, hi, my name is, and see what the response is. Working with our racial justice study group has taught me one important thing, and that is how much I didn't know about racial injustice. As a young person during the civil rights era and the feminist movement, I'm sure I thought that once the Civil Rights Act was passed, everything was good. We were seeing more black actors on TV and in commercials. Archie Bunker was being called out for his bigotry by Meathead, so it was all good, right? <laughs> As I sailed on through my young adulthood and starting a family, I felt proud about how I was teaching my children 
about accepting others and not judging by color or race. Life went on, but the events of the past four years or more has truly brought to light just how little progress has been made and how little aware I was of what was really happening. Had I ever really been aware of the ratifications of the 13th Amendment and how it allowed the chain gangs to be utilized? No, I had not. Watching the movie 13th with our group opened my eyes to so much. Did I even know the origins of our policing as we know it today and its roots in the paddy rollers who hunted down escaped slaves? Nope. Of course, I'd read and studied on my own about the horrors of slavery and families being torn apart at the whims of the white masters. I knew about the struggles after the Civil War and the carpetbag era. But any issues of race seemed so distant from my mostly white community, and I actually met my first black person at Wenatchee Valley College. While being aware in a peripheral way of inequities, it really hit home during the Obama, Obama administration. Watching the hate being spewed at a black man in power and watching our elected officials make it overtly known that they would thwart any progress in legislation made me realize how much this was about race. And then of course, came the following administration. To see a person who was supposed to lead our country actually encourage violence against people of color and anyone who did not follow his philosophies was horrifying. That's when I started to wake up and realize how much work needed to be done and that it needed to be done by white people who enjoy privilege, no matter how wealthy or poor they might be. I had to face my own biases, my own privilege, my own lack of action when seeing discrimination. One of the hardest things I have learned in my racial justice work is to listen to BIPOC people and to not interject my own story into the conversation. That alone is a big step that we could all take in this work. The materials that we have studied have enriched my understanding of these issues and the conversation with the others in the group have certainly helped to flesh out my knowledge and have given me space and safety to explore my own lack of understanding. And that in itself is a privilege. During the COVID isolation, I have become more vocal about injustices that I observe and more willing to question others when the subject arises. After being immersed in this learning experience, I often feel like an alien when observing how others behave and act. And I struggle to find a way to relate so that a civil discussion can take place. I look forward to more conversation, more education, and developing action plans so that I can be an advocate for those who have less of a voice than I do.
This past year, I have been fortunate enough to participate in one of our racial justice groups. Our group focused on a self-guided curriculum of research and exploration, which for me included several books, movies, lectures, interviews, conversations, and discussion at the local and national levels. Though I haven't finished them all, I've started several books that have given perspective on racial issues, like the award-winning children's book, We Are Water Protectors by Lindstrom. Beautiful book. I highly recommend it. Another is Braiding Sweet Grass by Kimmerer. This one is about indigenous wisdom. It's poetry, it's words. It is just so sweet and inviting. I highly encourage this one. Two by Ibram um, X. Kendi, who is really known for how to be an anti-racist. This is a really amazing book. Lots to um, digest and ch be challenged by. And he recently came out with Anti-Racist Baby, which I think is a super uh, fun book, um, challenging but poignant, and it's gonna be a gift for my nieces. And one that I would really like to um, bring up that doesn't get as much showtime out there is Race and the Cosmos by Barbara A. Holmes. And um, I joined an artistic group through the Grunewald Guild to explore this book and look at the conversation we have on race from a perspective of grandeur and awe, like the cosmos, big and cosmic and these beautiful words of um, amazement and awe, and use this language and this vocabulary in place of some of the language that we've seen used around victimization and limitation. And so the challenge there in this book is to look at our language that's used around racial justice. In the beginning, this whole conversation was very difficult and in many ways, extremely uncomfortable. I wasn't sure how to address this topic that has divided our nation and has fragmented communities for over decades. For hundreds of years, people of color have of course been enslaved and held back in so many ways that reparations just seems almost impossible, but it's not. As my education expanded into indigenous people's struggle of lies and broken promises, I found some hope in the work that Randy Lewis and Mary Big Bull Lewis are doing, like her work with Wenatchee Ware. I'm encouraged by the national UUA conversations and challenges we are stepping up with land acknowledgements, with statements of solidarity and personal attempts to make a difference. It's where it really happens. It's taking action as individuals, having conversations while we're on the hiking trail or at a family dinner or on vacations. There are some very dark stories in our past and it's important to know them and hear them and feel the emotion and deep pain that is associated with them. It is also important to take daily steps to make things better for all people. For me, it's working in the after school program in the Wenatchee School District that has helped me be more compassionate toward the at risk children in our community, many of whom are children of color. I show up, I'm present. My role is to encourage and educate and validate them and build relationships that matter. I've been challenged to step into places within my other jobs to make space and room for people of color to tell their stories. A group of us in the racial justice groups have formed the Climate Justice Task Force a, a, to become a Green Sanctuary 2030 congregation in the UUA. Racial justice is a primary component of this, as many populations of color are first to be affected or unjustly affected by climate change. In our region, we can look to how the wildfires affect our indigenous people on the reservations. Acknowledging that there is a problem and knowing ways that we can daily make a difference are steps we can all take. I challenge everyone to pick up a book and read about it, to watch a movie, or have a conversation about how to make our church, our community, our valley, our country, a more equitable place to thrive for all people. Get ready to be uncomfortable, but hey, let's realize that so many people of color live that reality every day. So thank you for walking with me on this journey.
I joined the Racial Justice Accountability Group because it seemed it was the right thing to do as a mother and matriarch of a diverse nuclear family. I believed I was not a racist. I even went so far as to profess, I don't see color. I see us all as equal. Yet a Facebook meme posted by my friend Karen around that same time made me stop and question myself. The post read simply, when did you realize you were white? When I didn't have a clear answer, I realized it was important for me to participate in a group conversation with hopes to learn more about the anti-racist movement. Like many things in my life, I have taken my usual Deb deep dive with my whole body into the self-study of racial justice and becoming an anti-racist. I've read many books this year by black indigenous people of color and watched movies and documentaries doing my best to pick up on the subtle implicit biases that influence society and create structural and institutional racism. I discovered three influential authors this, during this year's journey, Resma Menicum, Valerie Carr, and Isabel Wilkerson. While the first author set the stage for me to begin my shift of consciousness and was the inspiration behind a cuff service I coordinated last fall titled My Many Teachers, it was also the book that made me the most uncomfortable. It was difficult for me to fully participate in the meditations as strongly encouraged by the author in order to truly learn from his writing. The second gently embraced me with the maternal comfort I needed following that first book. This one reminded me of the value of wonder and love. These values have led me on my journey to the next level of my own spiritual awakening and helping me recognize some truths that had long been buried. The third book was the book that opened my eyes to the possibility I could be a racist simply by being born white. One night last month, I awoke with a start and my mind was busy in thought, connecting life's parallels that helped me realize I arrived at the Racial Justice Group Accountability Group in much the same way I had arrived at Al-Anon Family Groups and Cascade UU Fellowship simultaneously in 2008. There were crises outside of myself involving persons I love deeply, and my life was unmanageable in 2008. I was seeking the answers from an intellectual standpoint to regain control. Just tell me what I need to do, give me the handbook so I can read the guidelines, and then move on to help and fix my family. What I found once I started reading the books and listening to others share in the Racial Justice Accountability Group that pa this past year was that life had become unmanageable. And once again, I was looking for the guidelines of how to move on and fix the systemic racism in our society. This year, I have rediscovered creativity, curiosity, wonder, courage, and humility. I've reestablished a consistent daily meditation practice that has brought deep insight. And recently, I had a spiritual awakening as a result of my journey. Both Resma Menicum and Valerie Carr encouraged me and led meditations that helped me explore my past. The traumas of my past and the traumas of my ancestors' past have contributed to who I have become as an individual. What I have discovered is that my own professed colorblindness a year ago was not a sign I was already an anti-racist. It was actually a sign that, I'm, that my implicit bias actually qualify me as an implicit racist. One who is not intentionally racist, yet has the unconscious bias manifest by generations before me. When I awoke last month, my mind was not only busy connecting life parallels, 
It was busy planning a solution that could restore my personal sanity. That night, I came to believe that the 12 steps of recovery, simply listed as surrender, hope, faith, honesty, trust, willingness, humility, responsibility, accountability, awareness, patience, and service were exactly what I needed. They have been life-changing for me before. I believe they can be again. And all I needed to do was tailor them to fit the current problem I was facing. On a whim, or maybe it was the work of a power greater than myself, I decided to search online for a 12-step racism group and found exactly what I was searching for. On April 24th of this year, I joined racism, a racism group and attended my first RA meeting with that familiar introduction. Hi, I'm Deb and I'm a racist. If you were wondering, yes, that is a hard statement to make. And I wrestle with my own humility and doubt every day. I've been cautioned by trusted friends and family members that it's a statement that I probably shouldn't say publicly. Whew. Each day, I am learning to be more comfortable with the term that is associated with such negativity. I am learning there is a difference between explicit racism and implicit racism. I'm learning that being comfortable can be a privilege. Sitting with the discomfort is where the recovery begins. I encourage you, my faith family, if my calling myself a racist elicited an internal reaction, take a moment and connect with that uncomfortableness. What was the emotion behind the reaction? Where does that emotion show up in your body? When you reach the place of curiosity and want to talk, I'm still Deb and always have a willing ear. Our prayer comes from Reverend Clyde Grubbs. Let us pray. Source of life, we have been given time to measure our days. What are we to make of these times? These times in which we live and love and have our being. The road of history has been long, full of hope and disappointment. There have been wars and rumors of wars, violence and exploitation, hunger and homelessness and destruction. We know we cannot continue to live in the old way. We must make a change, seek a new way, a way leading toward peace with justice and a healthy planet. Creative spirit, you have given a vision for the good and we yearn for a new way. But where are we to find the courage to begin to work for this new beginning? We wonder what is required of us. We think of the prophets, men and women, who gave voice to unpopular opinion, who made personal sacrifices, sometimes their lives, for the sake of justice. May we be inspired and renewed by the courage of these witnesses. Let them empower us as we work for this vision. Amen. Please raise your spirit and voice in our closing hymn, Turning of the World.
I hope you have been inspired by our participants to engage in your own learning as well as action in racial justice. I'm sure any of them would be willing to have a conversation with you. I end our service with these words by Nelson Mandela. I have walked that long road to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way, but I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, only one finds that there are many more hills to climb. I have taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come. But I can rest only for a moment, for with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger for my long walk has not yet ended. Love be with you. Please join in our collective chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I encourage you to stick around for our closing slides created by Steve Klim. They highlight leaders in the work of justice. Thank you, Steve, for your work. Please raise your hands in the spirit of connection for our closing song. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Thank you.